A San Antonio police officer taken away in handcuffs after sheriff's deputies were called to investigate an assault. The charges he's now facing. Flames shooting from the roof. That's the scene firefighters found when they arrived at a home just north of downtown. We're going to take a look at the damage left behind. Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. Your monthly electricity bill's future hanging in the balance of a city council meeting today. CPS Energy proposing a rate increase for customers, and the city could approve it today. The 3.85% rate increase was unanimously approved by the CPS Energy Board of Trustees earlier this week. If it is approved by city council, CPS Energy estimates the average electric and gas customer would see around a $5 increase to their monthly bill, depending on how much power and gas they use. The increase to the base rate expected to generate about $73 million more every year for CPS. It says it'll use that money to make infrastructure improvements for extreme weather, replace some old computer systems and for staffing. They also say it would help cover costs paid by CPS Energy during the winter freeze. If City Council does approve the measure, the new rates would start March 1st. We have been seeing coronavirus cases rise in Comal County and now Comal County ISD extending an upcoming break for students and staff trying to slow the spread of COVID-19 inside schools. Superintendent Andrew Kibb says he wants students and staff to quote reset and recalibrate so they'll have the day off from school on Monday and Tuesday. That's according to a letter sent out by the district. In that letter, Kim says, quote, extending the already planned three day weekend will provide an opportunity for our COVID cases to slow down and allow us to conduct thorough campus cleaning and disinfection, end quote. Athletics, fine arts and other extracurricular events and practices will still take place. Students will not have a makeup day since Monday is the MLK holiday and Tuesday will now also be considered a holiday. Right now, more than 150,000 people are currently hospitalized with COVID all across the country. President Biden just announced a short time ago that federal resources will soon be in place to help the doctors and nurses who are reaching a breaking point yet again. ABC's Rena Roy has more. As the country battles yet another winter COVID surge, President Biden promising help is on the way. I've directed FEMA work with every state, territory, and the District of Columbia to make sure they have enough hospital bed capacity. The White House deploying military medical teams to some hard-hit hospitals in six states. They'll be working alongside overwhelmed health care workers to help ease the strain. As long as we have tens of millions of people who will not get vaccinated, we're going to have full hospitals and needless deaths. The U.S. is averaging more than 750,000 new COVID cases a day. Omicron estimated to account for 98% of new infections. Tents set up at L.A. area hospitals as patients stream in. We have doctors out there that are seeing patients wherever they can because the true physical space of the ED is completely full. In Sacramento, first responders frustrated as some patients wait up to eight hours for beds to open up. They essentially have to just stand there and wait uh, some sometimes eight hours for a bed uh, to transfer their patient. But some encouraging news data from a new study suggests those infected with Omicron are 91 percent less likely to die from the virus compared to the Delta variant. They are also half as likely to be hospitalized and have shorter hospital stays. And some areas appear to be reaching the peak of Omicron, including New York, where new cases seem to be flattening, and Massachusetts, where data from the state's Water Resources Authority shows a sharp decrease of COVID traces in wastewater. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. And new this dude is San Antonio police officer with legal troubles of his own now. SAPD says he's accused of hitting a woman in the face. Deputies say 28-year-old officer Christian Harris was arrested today after the Bear County Sheriff's Office responded to an assault call. A woman told deputies she jumped over several fences to get away from Harris after hiding from him near a shed in the backyard following a domestic dispute. According to deputies, Harris tried to leave the scene but was stopped a block away and taken into custody. SAPD officials say Harris has now been temporarily suspended without pay. Also new this noon, a house just north of downtown left with some serious damage after this fire broke out. When cars, crews got to the home, they say that the flames were coming through the home's roof. This was in the 900 block of Aguineer Avenue. That's not too far from West Woodlawn Avenue and Blanco Road. 
Firefighters say they were able to get the fire quickly under control. Aggressive fight on the fire, got it knocked down quickly and minimized the damage. Um, you know, fortunately, everyone was able to get out safely and we were able to get the dog out as well. The fire crews are still investigating what sparked this fire. Castle Hills police say they are having a tough time identifying two people who were killed in a crash early this morning. Neither of them had any identification on them. The crash happened on the ramp from the eastbound Loop 410 access road to military. As Katrina Weber tells us, police say it may have been due to drowsy driving. A call about a single vehicle crash would open up a lot of questions for Castle Hills police. They found a pickup slammed into a concrete barricade before 5.30 this morning on the ramp from Loop 410's access road to military. But what went wrong for the driver was anyone's guess. I think he was either asleep or maybe a medical episode. He was an elderly gentleman. Firefighters and paramedics quickly tended to that unconscious driver, cutting off the door to reach him and not realizing right away he wasn't their only patient. A woman in the passenger seat had become wedged beneath the dashboard. Originally, I thought it was only the driver, and it was probably about two minutes later when I actually observed that there was another passenger in the car. Firefighters also had to cut her free, then work to save her life. Both were rushed to a hospital, but did not survive. None of them had a seatbelt on. Um, I'm not too sure why, you know, especially in this time of age. Over there. Police say neither the driver nor the passenger had any ID on them. However, they say this truck is registered to someone in Divine, Texas, and they're going to see if any of that information may match up with the man who was behind the wheel. It was unfortunate, and hopefully we can notify their, their family members soon. It's just one question they hope to answer. Others, like what happened, may never be known. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Also this noon, the search for justice in a murder case continuing. Take a look at what's on your screen. These are newly released surveillance images from police. They're trying to find the driver of this vehicle. According to officers back in April of last year, 39 year old Jesus Cardenas was riding his bicycle in the 600 block of Evergreen Street. That's when a driver started to follow him. Police say someone in that vehicle shot Cardenas and then they took off. He was pronounced dead at the scene. If you have any helpful information, you can contact Crime Stoppers. The phone number to call 210-224-STOP. We've got some changes on the way by the weekend. Some much cooler temperatures some very gusty winds on the way, too. We have the latest on that forecast coming up. Hey, the Spurs back home, but things didn't get turned around. Didn't take advantage of that. Another couple of guys from COVID are back, though, and you hate to lose to the Rockets. More coming up in a minute. A group of local elementary school students, part of a unique program where they're learning from local architects to create workspaces throughout the schools. For months, Briscoe Elementary School students have been meeting with the architects to make their visions come true. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the spaces and the impact it's having on the students. My design here was to make kids feel excited to come to school and be creative and share their ideas. Fifth grade student Marcus Garillo is hoping to transform his school's hallway to this. I wanted to add like a little art gallery here for kids to put their um pictures of art that they want to put. Marcus is one of the students at Briscoe Elementary School working with local architects to create a workspace around the school. We use the measuring tape to measure how wide we wanted the whiteboard and how wide we wanted this to be and how big we wanted like the shapes to be on the walls. Briscoe Elementary School partnered with Alamo Architects and the nonprofit supporting multiple arts resources together, also known as SMART, to transform these unutilized spaces in the school. Five architects have uh, worked with a group of five students a piece to create these pods and they went through the whole design process. Kids are improving on their reading, writing, math and art skills and these spaces will allow students to learn and hang out outside of the classroom. This is a bookshelf with manga inside, anime books and we have little curtains so y'all can just have private space and we have 
a bench and carpet. This project has opened up students' eyes to different career opportunities. I would want to be an architect. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam, it's another one of those uh, Chamber of Commerce days. Look at that. What and look today? at the temperature, too. Yeah. I love it. Oh, it's perfect. It's going to feel great today, tomorrow. And then we, of course, changes this week. Wah, wah, wah. Another cold front. <laughs> uh, they're frequent this time of year. We would expect that. The aquifer is down today, three tenths of a foot, 662.9. Boy, we really do need some rain. We're going to talk more about that here in just a little bit. Drought monitor is in. It's not looking good. Mountain cedars in the moderate category today, 470. Molds are low at 310. Your full forecast is coming up. Our compliments to the chef. Yeah. But I tell you what, our thermometers better be working good because they're having to work super hard on days like today. Uh, yeah, you know, there, there has been a lot of back and forth uh, this winter. We've had a lot of fronts. These fronts just haven't been bringing us rain. That's one of the problems that we've uh, really been dealing with, contending with here. Drought monitor came in a little bit earlier this morning. You look across the state. I mean, just a year ago, we were in such good shape, and now most of Texas is within this drought. How do we read this map? Well, the yellow color indicates where areas are dry. That's not necessarily drought, but a precursor to it. But once you get into these orange uh, colors, the reds and maroons, that's representative of drought. And there's a large portion of Texas now dealing with that. Last week, 80% of the state was in drought. Now 82% of the state is in drought. So we just keep stepping this up. A little closer look here. Uh, closer to home in the area from Catula to Tilden all the way over to Carrizo Springs. That's an area that we're watching very dry. We need some rain there and an extreme drought now starting to pop up there uh, just west of Carrizo Springs. San Antonio still in the dry category, but it's, it's only a matter of time if we don't get any more rain uh, that, that we're going to be in the drought uh, conditions as well. Uh, Medina Lake, always important to look at during these drought times. It is only 26% full. It's down 47 feet, and it's down another three feet since we last looked three months ago. Outside, blue skies, certainly no rain on the horizon today. Temperatures sitting at 70 degrees. It is beautiful, though. 72 Stinson. We've got a little bit of a westerly wind, and right now not getting reports from Kelly or Randolph. 69 Boulevardi, 60 Canyon Lake, 72 in New Braunfels. 71 Hondo, 71 in Bandera. So a lot of places starting to jump up to, into the 70s now. The air is very dry, so you will see some pretty nice swings from those morning lows up into the afternoon highs. 70 in Catula, 67 Beville, 68 right now in Gonzales. Here's what you can expect the rest of today. Lots of sun. Northwesterly winds will be anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour. We'll peak at about 4 p.m. 74 degrees, dropping down into the 60s by 6 p.m. and eventually low 60s by 8 p.m. and we will get back into the 40s tomorrow morning. Dew points have been very, very low. The air has been very dry. It gets even worse as we get into the weekend. Look at these dew points. Once you get dew points like this, that is desert air. And once we get some wind on Saturday, that brings up a bit of a concern because we got gusty winds. We showed you the drought monitor. It hasn't rained in a while. And uh, with these dew points, the dry air, there is going to be a wildfire risk, I think, especially west of San Antonio. That's something we'll be keeping an eye on. As you look at the big picture across the country, a little bit of unsettled weather uh, underneath the trough off to the east and then some unsettled weather out west. But most of the middle part of the country enjoying some beautiful January weather. Our forecast calls for 76 coming up tomorrow. Then we get a system developing here across the middle part of the country. Dig south. This pushes a cold front through. That should be here early Saturday morning. In fact, before sunrise on Saturday. And that's going to allow temperatures to fall into the 50s for highs. So there's your cool down. But we'll also get a tight pressure gradient and we'll get those gusty winds. Does not bring us any rain. But once it passes us by, this is going to be a big weather maker for the East Coast, putting down some pretty heavy snow as it works up the East Coast. That'll be Sunday into Monday. We'll be on the back side of it by that time. Wind gust forecast for Saturday. This is, I think, probably the biggest factor we're going to have to watch Saturday. Gusts 45 potentially, especially during the morning hours on Saturday. So you'll wake up to some very gusty winds. They'll try to calm some by Saturday afternoon and even more so by Sunday morning. And that will allow temperatures to drop down to 30 Sunday morning. So a freeze possible, 59 Sunday. We're back into the 60s 
for Martin Luther King Jr. Day and then 70s Tuesday and Wednesday. Guys. Thank you so much, Justin. Hey, the Cowboys have everybody ready to roll against the 49ers this weekend. They're going to need everybody, too. And the Texans is focusing in on a busy offseason coming up. After a seven-game road trip, the Spurs back home at AT&T Center last night, ready to face the Houston Rockets. And how about some good news? Kelvin Johnson and Devin Vassell back off the COVID list. We're still waiting on Derek White and Doug McDermott, though. The Rockets blasted off pretty fast. The lead was 12 before the Spurs even got things going. Jock Landell comes up with the steal and gets it ahead to Vassell. Takes it back to the bucket. Part of the 8-0 run. Rockets led lead was down to four final seconds of the first half. Four was from the corner. You saw that one with the three, but that gave up 39 in the first half. They were down 39-36. They take their first lead when Bryn Forbes connects for his sixth three of the half. It's 61-59 into the quarter. It's a 20-7 run from the Spurs. Murray gets the layup in less than two seconds in the half, and the Spurs are up 67-63 at the break. We go to the third quarter. Here comes Lonnie Skywalker, the fourth. Bam! Nice dish from DeJounte. Throws down the jam. It's an 8-0 run. Spurs up 9. But the Rockets close on the 13-4 run to take a one-point lead going into the fourth. Spurs down 7 under a minute to go. DeJounte knocks down the 3. It's a four-point game. 29 seconds to go. 19 of his 32 coming in the fourth. The 32 points is a new career high, but the Rockets make their free throws down the stretch. The Spurs fall 128-124. to First quarter killed us. Got us in the hole. And, you know, we had to fight up out of it. So... No, I mean, they pushed the ball, they pushed the pace as we expected, you know, and uh, we just got to start better, start the game better. All right, so they got a chance to start a game better tomorrow night when they host the Cleveland Cavaliers at 730 in the AT&T Center. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys had a full squad in practice yesterday. Health and safety protocols kept a couple of guys out, including star rookie linebacker Mike Parsons, cornerback to Anthony Brown. Trayvon Diggs was out because of a illness. That's why he missed the last game against Philly. Left tackle Tyron Smith is also out. He's in the NFL's health and safety protocols, but also was listed as limited in practice due to his knee and ankle. Parsons talked about having lunch with future Hall of Famer DeMarcus Ware and getting some playoff tips. Here's what Parsons had to say when he found out the 49ers offense liked to play bully ball. I'm from Harrisburg where the bullies get bullied, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, there's a bully in every gym. There's a bully everywhere you go. But at one point, it's going to take someone to stand up and, you know, and fight. And I ain't never backed down from a challenge, so... I would never say you can bully a line, ever. He's where the bullies get bullied. That's where he's from. Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator Dan Quinn preparing for his head-to-head -head battle on Sunday with his former offensive coordinator in Atlanta, now San Francisco head coach Kyle Shanahan. At the same time, Quinn's name is being mentioned in Denver about becoming the Broncos' next head coach, but he also helped Cowboys offensive coordinator Kellen Moore prepare for his interview for the vacant head coaching position in Jacksonville brother to brother and teammate to teammate just to make sure um, you know if there's anything on his mind that you know can go across I had a chance to go through some and I've uh, through the years interviewed a lot of people so I thought if there was a chance just to pass that along uh, to someone else um, it's totally worth doing and uh, one day years from now when he's a head coach uh, you know and doing his thing you know he'll be able to pass along that too. That's pretty cool. The Houston Texans went 4-13 and 13 this offseason, and that means they have a lot of work to do in the offseason. One thing they are focused in on, getting ready for the draft and who they will select with the number three overall pick. They also have to figure out what to do about Deshaun Watson and his Davis Mills, the quarterback of the Texans' future, and should David Scully stay on as head coach. As of now, Scully says he hasn't been told anything different, but what do the players have to say about it if he was sacked? You can talk to a guy who's been traded a lot, so uh, it's a business. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's what I would say. But, you know, he, he's a great coach. Like I say, he, he, he meant well to us this year and uh, had a lot of energy and, and did a lot of positive things. But, you know, as we all know in this business, things happen. Yeah, with all that mess with Deshaun Watson, though, got to give him another chance. Got to give him another year, see what he can do. One more year. Well, at least. Okay. New at 5, if you are searching for those rare at-home COVID tests, 
yeah, they're pretty hard to come by. But if by chance you come across a website or an app that is selling them, how do you know if that's legit? Coming up today at 5, 12 on your size, Marilyn Mortz tells us what you can do to make sure that you are not buying a fake kit. President Joe Biden continuing to push for his new voting rights legislation at the Senate Democratic luncheon on Capitol Hill today. Senate Democrats trying to force a public showdown over elections legislation, even though there's no assurance that the bill will even come to a vote. Democrats do not have the support of Republicans, so they're trying to change the Senate rules to go around their opponents. However, they also don't have support from all 50 Democrats when it comes to changing those Senate rules to pass that legislation on their own. The House Select Committee investigating the Capitol riots wants Kevin McCarthy to testify about his conversations with former President Trump in the days and weeks surrounding the attack on the Capitol. However, McCarthy, who is the House Minority Leader, is rejecting their request and even questioning the legitimacy of the committee's investigation. McCarthy initially denounced former President Trump, but two weeks later refused to say anything else on the topic. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Accept his share of responsibility. I don't have anything really to add. I've been very public, um, but I wouldn't hide from anything. The committee is also asking a couple of other sitting Republican lawmakers who are allies of the former president to speak with them. Another lawsuit has been filed in connection to the deadly shooting on the Rust movie set. This time, the armorer is suing the ammunitions supplier. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins died on October 21st from a gunshot wound when a gun that Alec Baldwin pointed fired a live round. Hannah Gutierrez Reed is blaming Seth Kenny and his company, PDQ Arm and Prop, for bringing the live rounds onto the set. Blanks and dummies should have been the only ammunition present. Reed's lawsuit also revealing new details, including how shortly before the revolver was handed off to actor Alex Baldwin and it was loaded, there was a new box of ammunition, presumed to be harmless, somehow just appeared. The new lawsuit alleges unfair trade practices, introduces dangerous products and false labels and misrepresentation. A congressional gold medal has been posthumously awarded to Emmett Till and his mother. The U.S. Senate voted this week to honor the mother and son with the highest civilian honor. Till was 14 years old visiting Mississippi when two white men kidnapped and killed him before dumping his body in the Tallahatchie River back in 1955. The men were later acquitted of the murder by an all-white jury. Till's mother chose to have an open casket funeral to show the world the brutal way her son was murdered. A companion bill to the Senate's legislation has been introduced in the U.S. House. Looking outside with live cam, wow. you want to go outside. I'm just giving you a little advice. Nice day. Lunch on the porch? Lunch on the porch would be great. Sign me up. I'm there for it. Uh, let's. Uh, you see the, the, the scene outside, a lot of blue skies. We're already up near 70 degrees. This morning we started off in the 30, so it shows you our range of temperatures when we have this really dry air in place. It, it's chilly in the mornings, but really nice in the afternoons. Lows this morning down to 32, Bernie stage 28 in Kerrville. So we did have a freeze up in the hill country. Hondo got down to freezing 29 there. No freezing temperatures reported across Bear County. 37 in Del Rio this morning. Did get down to 30 in Carrizo Springs. They did see a freeze there, but temperatures have rebounded nicely. Here's a look at the time lapse, and what a beautiful day. Very beautiful sunrise. Temperatures again now at uh, 70 degrees here in San Antonio. Calm winds. Dew point is at 37, so that's that dry air we mentioned. 72 already in New Braunfels, 73 in Pleasanton. You look at Carrizo Springs, it started out at 30, now up to 70, gaining 40 degrees just like that with uh, sunny skies and dry air, 70 in Del Rio right now. And the forecast for today will be up around uh, 74 this afternoon. Northwest Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Guys. Thank you so much, Justin. The U.S. blood supply now dangerously low. In fact, the American Red Cross is declaring a nationwide blood crisis. Here in our community, the need for blood donors is nothing new. However, Local blood banks have been able to rely on other partners in the state. Well, now that lifeline is no longer in place and supplies are low everywhere else. 
As Lee Waldman reports, the issue has life-threatening consequences. Cake. <laughs> you like cake? What kind of cake do you like to bake? Mmm, I bake velvet, chocolate. Mia Perez is a beautiful eight-year-old girl who likes to bake with her mom and play Minecraft with her siblings. She's also battling a rare form of leukemia. It attacks the bone marrow. So um, she needed blood right away, and then that never stopped. Mia's mom, Teresa, is one of many who are on edge after hearing our blood shortage has reached a critical level nationwide. The biggest fear is just her not being able to continue her treatment. Dr. Leslie Grebon is the medical director of University Hospital's Transfusion Services. In her 10 years in the field, she's never been more worried about what this means for patients. We're going to get to the point where we're not going to have enough for them or the people who are massively bleeding. And that's that's scary because then that's acute life threatening things that are going to end up killing the patient. The majority of their blood comes from their own blood center. We are consistently running at 50 percent or below our critical inventory level. So it's it's we're in the red. We are in a danger area. If they turn to the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, they would be competing with other hospitals across South Texas and the condition of their patient in the hospital. It'll come down to me having discussions with physicians about what is the prognosis of your patient? If this is a, a horrible bleeding patient, are they likely to survive? If not, I can't waste resources on this patient. We are hovering around a two day supply of blood and half a day supply of O positive blood from the STBTC. Normally that center can ask for help from other blood banks, but not anymore. With this nationwide blood crisis, there is no one to to help move that blood from another state or another city. The Red Cross is reporting a 10% drop in donors, a fact that needs to change so children battling cancer like Mia can keep getting the treatment she needs. Just try it one time and think about the person that you're really helping out. You're not just helping the patient, but you're helping the whole family get through something really tough. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. You can see how important this is. You can donate directly to University Hospital by scheduling a donation there. And you can do that at DonateBloodToday.com or you can call 210-358-2812. To schedule a donation with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, you can go to southtexasblood.org or you can call them at 210-731-5590. You can use your phone's camera if you really want to cut to the chase and scan that QR code on your screen right now. Go to ksat.com where we have all the information as well as links to the registration portals for University Hospital and the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. You can also donate at a community blood drive this weekend. It'll be hosted by the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center at the AT&T Center. The drive starts Saturday morning at 830. It runs through the afternoon till 130. As an added incentive, the first 400 donors will get two free Spurs tickets as well as a coupon for a free pint of ice cream, a t-shirt, and a $10 value in donor rewards. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah. All right, still too early for you to submit your tax returns. However, the IRS is already warning people your refund might be delayed this year. We're gonna take a look at the reasons why still ahead. And all oh, those higher prices, you are probably seeing them just about everywhere. So how much longer are you gonna have to uh, deal with higher costs. We'll let you know after the break. The number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits rose last week to the highest level since mid-November. U.S. jobless claims went up by 23,000 last week. However, totals are still low by historic standards. The weekly applications have now risen four of the last five weeks. It could be a sign that the Omicron variant is having an impact on the job market, which has bounced strongly from last year's coronavirus recession. And inflation continues to rise. It's gone up 7% over the last 12 months, the largest jump since 1982. But it gets worse. The price of meat, poultry, fish, and eggs up 12.5% from just a year ago. And it's not just at the grocery store. Used car prices, yeah, up nearly 
40% from last year. Rent prices up about 4%, fueling the surge, a combination of pandemic-induced supply chain disruptions along with increasing demand from consumers. The White House is saying it could take the rest of this year for prices to come back down. Many of you focused on the annual 7% rate. Um, if we are trying to look at uh, where we are headed, the month-to-month -month changes are more instructive. Uh, and most independent forecasters uh, continue to project that we will see moderation in price increases uh, over the course uh, of 2022. And that is why the Federal Reserve has elected to hike interest rates four times throughout the course of this year. That means that borrowing will become more expensive However, savings accounts will earn more. If high prices aren't enough for you, how about a chaotic tax season? That could be filled with what the IRS is calling enormous challenges. That means your refund may take a bit longer to get to you. CNN's Gene Sullivan has a closer look at what's causing the backlog and what you can do to navigate any potential issues. A warning from the IRS. This tax season is going to be messy. The Treasury Department says pandemic-related issues and budget constraints may lead to a delayed tax refund, and tax professionals are bracing for any potential issues. I anticipate this tax season to be extremely busy, um, not only for the tax preparers, you know, but also for the taxpayers as well. The IRS blaming staff shortages for creating a nightmare scenario, saying it might have one million returns backlogged, but the number this year is several times worse. You know, we're working as hard as we can. The IRS also saying it needs more money. It's an issue the agency's commissioner raised before Congress at a hearing last year, saying while the tax code has grown more complicated, the funding has stayed the same. And call centers can't keep up. The IRS says it was unable to answer two thirds of the calls it received last year. And processing centers for paper tax returns were closed for much of the pandemic. All this adds to an already complicated tax filing year with COVID relief and increased child tax credits. They sent out half of it in 2021, which has to be reconciled on the 2021 tax return. So that's going to create a lot of chaos. So what does this mean for you? Tax experts recommend you file early. The IRS begins taking returns on January 24th and file electronically. Experts say that filing paper forms is going to add time. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. It does feel like it's uh, time to file your taxes no. with weather like this. This is no. like April weather. No. It does feel a little bit like that, doesn't it? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, that's just a beautiful scene there. We can leave that up for a while. Enjoy it. We're, we're going to get some great weather today and tomorrow. Things do change a little bit by this weekend. So far today up to 70. We'll get it to the mid 70s this afternoon. The low this morning was 36, so we've jumped up big time. The average is 63, so we are going to be above average. Not near the record, though, or at least not at the record of 81. Set back in 1907. Big story this weekend will be gusty winds. We'll have another look at that forecast coming up. Tax season. Come on. I wish it was rainy season. That'd be nice. Yeah, we need yeah, some Yeah, this is getting kind of serious. It's been about two or three months now since we've gotten some, some good rain. We do, we do need uh, some, some good soaking rains for South Texas. And you're right, it's serious in the sense that if we get some gusty winds, which we may get on Saturday, the threat for fires and that sort of thing starts to kick up. We're maybe not quite there yet, but something to watch on Saturday. We put out a story on KSAD.com if you want to check it out, talking about that threat this weekend. In the meantime, 24-hour temperature change. We're up about 18 degrees from where we were yesterday. Things have warmed up very, very nicely. A lot of that's due to more sun. Sun's been out all day. We've got dry air that allows those temperatures to really jump up. Right now, 70 degrees at the airport. Says mostly sunny, but I don't see any clouds. We're going to call it sunny in my book. Calm winds, dew point is at 37. The air is still very dry. 72 Comfort, 72 in New Braunfels, 74 Pleasanton, 71 in Divine. Almost everybody's in the 70s at this point. And I mentioned earlier, Carissa Springs started the morning out below freezing, already up to 72. Uh, just an amazing warm up there. 69 Uvalde, 70 in Del Rio, uh, 70 in Victoria. And uh, here's the forecast temperatures this afternoon. Uh, by the time we get into 4 o'clock, we'll be uh, in, in the mid 70s. And by tonight, with clear skies and dry air again in place, temperatures fall off into the 40s again. So not quite as cold as, 
as this morning, but still chilly nonetheless. You want the jacket tomorrow morning. Dew point tracker. Well, all this dry air, well, it sticks with us uh, even into Friday. It tries to jump up a little bit, but not enough. Not enough to give us any rain with this next front. Front comes through pre dawn on Saturday, and the dew points just really bottom out here. This is some very, very dry air, those gusty winds. We talked about that threat on Saturday when the, when the winds pick up. Uh, it's not going to be a great situation, especially west of San Antonio where the drought has really kicked in. Big picture, everything's kind of moving up and around. Texas uh, looks like we got a trough out east. Rain, a little bit of rain, some snow mixed in there across the northeast, and then some slightly active weather. Not, uh, not any big issues out west around Los Angeles and up there near Portland and Seattle. So we've been watching the upper level pattern. It's still going to be warm tomorrow, 76 degrees. I would not be surprised if we saw a few 80s on the map tomorrow afternoon. But then our storm system starts to gather strength here. This pushes almost due south, a little bit southeast, but it uh, draws in some colder air, pushes that cold front through. It's not going to be bitterly cold. I mean, highs on Saturday will be in the upper 50s. We can deal with that. But those gusty winds uh, will certainly be in place, especially Saturday morning. Then as this storm system pushes east, it finally taps into some moisture, not over Texas, but over the southeast. And they get some snow, some good rain, some th thunderstorms across parts of Florida. That'll be on Sunday. And then this storm system works up the uh, east coast through the day on Monday, causing more problems as it does. So that's where all the weather will be with that system. For us, our next cold front arrives Saturday, I think between midnight and 3 a.m. on Saturday here in San Antonio and then pushing through the rest of the area by about sunrise. Temperatures only reach the mid 50s as we talked about and then gusty winds up to 45 miles per hour on Saturday and then a possible freeze Sunday morning. So that's the effects that we'll have on our forecast. And you see it here in the seven day of 57 Saturday windy 59 Sunday after starting off at 30. Then we rebound back into the 60s and 70s next week with mostly sunny skies and we've kind of just been stuck in this pattern rain stays out of the forecast for now. We'll be right back. A simple word game has a lot of people captivated online. It's called Wordle. <laughs> Wordle? And it appears to be the hottest thing since Sudoku. Here's ABC's Will Gans with more. Guys, I am obsessed with Wordle. Can't stop, won't stop. Okay, okay, what is Wordle? It's a free word game. The mission, to guess a five-letter word in six tries or less. After each guess, the tiles change colors. Green means it's the right letter and it's in the right spot. Yellow means the letter is in the word but in the wrong spot. Gray means the letter's not in the word at all. It's kind of like that old game show, Lingo. Times, T-I-M-E-S. Well, you guys are good. It's the same word every day for everybody and you can only play once a day. The game was created by software engineer Josh Wardle as a gift for his partner who loves guessing games. There's no app, it's just a website with no ads and you don't have to enter your email. Josh telling NPR, quote, the rejection of some of those things has actually attracted people to the game because it feels quite innocent and it just wants you to have fun with it. But recently, in a move that many are calling S-H-A-D-Y, this guy, Zach Shaked, released Wordle the App, a game with the same concept and a pro mode with unlimited play for a $30 annual subscription. Twitter wasn't having it. Steal is a five-letter word. Congrats. Apple removed Shaked's game and similar knockoffs from the App Store on Tuesday. Shaked has since apologized. Meanwhile, Josh Wardle is happy his free, no-frills game is bringing people together in a time like this one. Okay, if you want to get into the game, there are a few words you can use as your first guesses to help narrow down the letters. For vowels, try the word adieu. That has four vowels in it. And for consonants, try the word snort. It has four of the most popular consonants in it. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. He just hacked the whole gang for us. <laughs> Too bad SA Live is six letters and not five. Yeah. So that was you ever play yeah. Wordle? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's space in there too. So. Yes. Okay. All right. Anyway. Well, we want you to, of course, <laughs> feed your body and keep it healthy as yeah. we head into January. And of course, this weekend there is what six playoff games going on like that. And what's your favorite playoff games? But. <laughs> 
Buffalo wings. Griselda Munoz is here, but these aren't your ordinary buffalo wings, are they? Mm -mm. No, they're not. They're made out of cauliflower, and they're super delicious. And the nice thing about cauliflower, you said it's very healthy, but it also, the flavor takes on other flavors really good, right? Yeah, that is correct. So cauliflower is so versatile that you can add any flavor into them. All right. We're going to give them a try. And yeah. of course, a lot of folks might be, you know, enjoying a dry January. So we have some great mocktail recipes to show you from Twang. Look at all the goodies on there. <laughs> yeah, really, really tasty things. You know, it's a San Antonio company, 35 years old. And Jen is going to camp, at least a camp for adults, right? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Jen. <laughs> That's right. Maybe you're not doing a dry January. Well, this is the perfect place for you. We're at Camp 1604, the newest hotspot in town. Perfect. They've got TVs. Playoffs are this weekend, but they also have delicious food. We've got some Texas Twinkies here, some delicious street tacos. I may even try some archery. Yeah, we're going to have some fun coming back out here in a little bit. Back to you guys. Okay, one day she's throwing axes, the next day it's bow and arrow. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, a lot going on there. For Girl, Scout, Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> yes, indeed. They are up for sale, and there's some new ones out. But mm -hmm. what's which your favorite? cookie are you, or what's your favorite? We are going to have some fun with a quiz that you can try at home as well. Okay, if you are not into football and something else to do, we have got a list as long as your arm of all the activities coming up for in and around town for this long holiday weekend.